how yeah. I can do it. Like Just that. It's perfect. It's okay. Great. Okay, we'll just get we'll give it two minutes and then we'll begin. Mm -hmm. But people are, are entering right now. Mm -hmm. Eric, is it okay? No. Okay. okay, well, thank you everyone for coming today for uh, the third installment of our Cold War in the Heartland Lecture Series. My name is Eric Scott, and I am the director of KU's Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And I'm really, really happy today uh, to welcome uh, Victoria Zhiravlyova, uh, who's joining us from Moscow, where it's uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. So she's uh, giving us her, her after work time to, to present uh, here in Kansas uh, at our lunch hour. Uh, her talk is entitled how Russia and America's Cold War of Images ended and began again. And, um, and she is really the, the perfect uh, person for this series uh, and, and for the subject. Um, you know, the series, as, as we've discussed, is really about bringing together uh, global and, and local perspectives on the Cold War uh, and looking at how the Cold War played out in everyday life. And uh, this talk is both both global and local, and and about uh, the Cold War's visual aspects, uh, which are which were really crucial uh, to the way the conflict was imagined and experienced, and uh, continue to be very relevant as as uh, Professor Zhiravlyova will talk about today, uh, in the way that uh, the U.S. and, and Russia imagine uh, each other. Uh, so. Just to give you a brief, uh, brief uh, background, uh, Professor Victoria Zhiravlyova is Professor of American History and International Relations, as well as the Chair of the American Studies Department and the Vice Dean of the Faculty of International Relations and Area Studies at the Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow. And she is one of Russia's leading experts on US-Russian relations and US foreign policy. She's published uh, many books, uh, including uh, the monograph Understanding Russia in the United States, Images and Myths. Uh, uh, she's co-authored a textbook, World History of the 20th Century, co-authored a volume on Russia and the U.S. Diplomatic Relations 1900 to 1917, um, has worked on many other volumes, including works on Abraham Lincoln, uh, mutual representations and textbooks of the U.S. and, and Russia, uh, uh, war in American culture uh, and revolution and revolutionary discourse in the United States. Uh, in addition to being an active uh, scholar and, and professor, she's a member of several editorial boards uh, and uh, she is an alumna of the Fulbright program and the Kennan Institute program. Uh, she was awarded the Medal of the Russian Ministry of Education uh, for the development and improvement uh, in her students' research activities. Uh, so Professor Zhiravlyova and I actually met, um, although we had been introduced uh, virtually by my colleague uh, Norman Saul in the, the history department here at Kansas. Uh, we met, I think, about three years ago in person in, in, in Sarajevo at a conference. It seems like longer. Uh, this is back in the days of, of travel. Um, but uh, we, we really had hoped to, to bring her to campus uh, in person, uh, but we're, we're delighted uh, that she can join us virtually for this, for this talk. Um, so I will hand things over to her. Uh, she'll talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open things up for questions. If you have questions, uh, feel free to enter it in the chat. And before I, I uh, turn things over to her, I also wanted to mention, uh, if you haven't already marked in your calendars, uh, April the 27th, uh, 12 p.m. Um, for our final talk of the series, Ivan Kurila will be joining us, uh, also a, a leading Russian scholar. Uh, talking about the Cold War and its aftermath in Russia and the U.S. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Professor Zhirovlyova. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, 
uh, just go ahead and type them in the chat or uh, use the Q&A function. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, uh, for your introduction. Uh, thank you for having me now uh, and for your uh, invitation. This is a big honor for me to be uh, with you in this virtual conference, in this virtual lecture room. Uh, today, uh, I'm planning to focus my attention on the period of the end of the Cold War, in reality, from 1987 uh, to 1991, until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and if uh, uh, I will find time to tell some words uh, as a conclusion about the current war of images, okay, it will be okay. If not, you can ask me uh, about it. So, uh, in the late uh, 1980s, the Soviet and American leaders, diplomats, politicians moved away from the confrontation of the Cold War toward building cooperation bridges. The dialogue uh, between uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan served to launch this process. In the USSR, the glasnost policy resulted in abolition censorship. In 1987, Voice of America's and BBC's radio broadcasts were no longer jammed. The number of Soviet-American cultural exchanges, contacts between members of various organizations and of civic initiatives reached at unprecedented scale and continued to grow. So the ice of the Cold War was broken both at the state and at the public levels. These development created, developments created prerequisites uh, for changing visual paradigm as representations of the overall ideas Americans and Russians had of each other. In turn, the abolition of the Cold War of Images advanced the Soviet-American dialogue, I mean top-level dialogue, as it demonstrated that the two states' leaders and peoples were sincere in their intentions and in their desires to bring down the Iron Curtain. The imagological disarmament, so-called imagological disarmament, at the end of the Cold War manifested itself very brightly in cartoons, in movies, films, and uh, even in animation. So these visual primary sources will be in the center of my analysis. And the first part uh, of this presentation about the dynamics of mutual images in cartoons. So during the Cold War, political cartoons uh, used as a propaganda weapon in the war of images between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, as a text represented by symbols and as information fast food, cartoons made it possible to express feelings and sentiments that were frequently hard to verbalize. Uh, cartoons also employed the crucial mechanism of satire and humor. In their visual texts, Soviet and American cartoonists both illustrated their dominant sentiments, prejudices, and stereotypes, and also directly participated in constructing new public preferences. Responding to Soviet-American relations agenda, cartoonists worked on the ideological front lines of the Cold War and did their best to convince their readers how lucky they were to be an American or in contrary, uh, a Soviet man. The context, uh, contents of Soviet political cartoons changed radically in Gorbachev era. Starting in the fall of 1987, their degree of anti-Americanism was decreasing steadily as, for instance, and uh, uh, in any case, their deepest dips were directly aligned with the results of USSR, US summit. Uh, as, for instance, in December 1987, I mean, Washington summit, or at the end of May, at the beginning of June of 1989. 
uh, I mean Moscow summit of Gorbachev and uh, uh, Reagan. Soviet political cartoons collapsed as a propaganda weapon targeted, targeted in the United States after Gorbachev's speech at the UN General Assembly on December 7, 18, 1988. Uh, I would like to remind you that he abolished the class struggle tome during this uh, speech. To confirm this statement, we just need to turn to the cartoons published in the leading Soviet satirical magazine, Crocodile, and to the central newspapers such as Izvestia and Pravda. Uh, uh, both of these outlets regularly published cartoons. And by the way, uh, Crocodile was far more flexible than the newspapers in presenting its materials. Uh, in January, May 1987, the crocodile went through the last wave of anti-American sentiments. This surge stemmed from the uh, President Reagan's uh, uh, unwillingness to abandon the Strategic Defense Initiative program, as he made clear during the Reykjavik summit. And pay attention to the screen, you see examples, uh, features of this last wave of anti-Americanism. Uh, left cartoon here. Uh, this cartoon published on the cover of uh, the magazine's uh, January issue is an example of criticism leveled at the US nuclear militarism in general and at the strategic defense initiative program in particular. These cartoons uh, depicted the Statue of Liberty whose crown casts a shadow of nuclear missiles. And uh, this cartoon is in absolutely in the Cold War style. Author of this cartoon, uh, Boris Yefimov, who was famous Soviet cartoonist, and he uh, published this cartoon in April. This cartoon depicts the conversation between cowboy and uh, his passengers. And in reality, it was mocking of the cultural diplomacy of the United States during the Cold War. Uh, American cowboy dri uh, driving a wagon, captioned American cultural expert, tells to his uh, passengers their names, Soviet threat, Rambo, horror films, and pornography. Pay attention to this tablet. You have my word, we will make this West wild. But uh, by mid summer uh, of 1987, large scale, full cover anti American cartoons had vanished from the crocodile entirely. At the same time, Soviet cartoonists abandoning the use of Nazi symbols to mark the image of the United States as enemy number one which also evidenced real changes in their representations of the United States. This is the first very important trend. By the way, during current war of images, uh, we can find uh, the uh, backing of this idea because uh, a Russian cartoonist such as Vitaly Podvitsky is using Nazi symbols to label the United States as an enemy. But at the end of the Cold War, uh, we see another trend. The second trend was reprinting American cartoons. Uh, and it was done with the view to showing the other point of view as having a right to exist as well. The magazine's reader uh, could see, for instance, the cartoons of Jerry Robinson. Uh, he was the president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. Uh, by the way, Jerry Robinson um, presented his cartoons personally because he visited Moscow uh, as a participant of the workshop, How We See Each Other, organized by the Soviet uh, Peace Committee. Uh, in his interview, interview Robinson, uh, and he was uh, a, a descendant um, of the um, uh, immigrants, who had uh, fled the Tsarist Russia at the end of the 19th century. So 
uh, he emphasized in his interview, pay attention to the screen. I would like to uh, emphasize the uh, last sentence in this abstract, in this citation. I am convinced that instead of fearing, we should try to understand each other. This is very important idea. And this idea is very actual now. Real changes in representing the United States uh, took place in the Pravda and the Zvesti newspaper as well. Pay attention to the screen. Over 1988, these newspapers were gradually abandoning the image of Uncle Sam as a symbol of the American evil. Even when this image did appear, it became progressively specific without generally focusing on the crimes of American imperialism. The third very crucial aspect of the visual tone was the publication of pro-American and anti-Soviet cartoon. For example, uh, in uh, the February issue of Crocodile, you can find cartoon depicted a conversation between the Soviet rubble and American door, stressing that the former was not had currency unlike the latter. And cartoon published in Pravda, uh, uh, and it was also in 1989, this cartoon depicted Soviet bureaucrats throwing up obstacles in the path of their honest American businessmen. The latter's image had nothing to do with the depiction of corrupt American capitalists and imperialists of the Cold War era. So as the format of Soviet-American relations changed, the degree of anti-Americanism in the Soviet satirical discourse was steadily falling so that eventually the American other came to be used as criticize the Soviet self. Such a development had been unimaginable during the Cold War era. Uh, this cartoon of uh, cartoonist Abramov, he's also very, he was also very famous Soviet the cartoonists clearly demonstrated the changes in the imagological climate in the Soviet-American relations. Gorbachev presented this cartoon to President uh, George Bush on September 9, 1990, during the Helsinki summit. This cartoon reflected the idea that the victory in the Cold War was common, that it was common victory of the leaders of the United States and of the USSR. Uh, and this is, uh, from my point of view, very important, crucial issue in this visual tone. This is the result of this visual tone. tone. Uh, and um, in any case, uh, when this cartoon uh, was published in November 1991 in Crocodile, it was the end of the period of the Soviet Union. Uh, because very soon, uh, the uh, uh, collapse of the Soviet Union happened. So what we can see in this uh, cartoon, uh, every scene from my point of view in this cartoon advanced the international and political internal changes. The figure of the players, an impoverished um, and shabby Max, and a draper, a Western gentleman, and the ideolo ideological and economic oppositions. Communism versus capitalism, poverty versus prosperity. So this is a very interesting visual self-representation of the Soviet Union, because this is idea, uh, and this is a visual admitting of the idea that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War as a system, as a system, because uh, uh, during the Cold War, we see the contradictions between two systems. On January 31, 
1990, the first McDonald's was opened in the center of Moscow on Tverskaya Street. And the, uh, uh, this event symbolized the USSR's integration into the global mass consumer culture that in reality was essentially American culture. As many Americans observed standing, uh, observed uh, the McDonald's craze, they noted the paradox. People spent two, three, and even four hours standing in line to enjoy fast food. But in reality, it was the paradox of Gorbachev politics as well. He wanted to preserve socialism and the supremacy of the Communist Party functionaries while opening the USSR to the Western influence. Uh, a cartoon of Rob Rogers, a cartoonist with Pittsburgh Press, is a perfect illustration of this dilemma of Gorbachev's era. Pay attention to the portraits. Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and Ronald McDonald. Uh, the clown, clown Ronald McDonald, uh, McDonald's company mascot. And with uh, this cartoon, we turn to analyzing American cartoons that were gradually abandoning the demonic image of the Soviet leaders and the evil empire those leaders stood for. Uh, it seems to me that it appears reasonable to turn uh, to personified images here because first of all, Western observers have been and still are looking at the activities of Russia's rulers from thus to presidents to access positive and negative changes in Russia. And second, the gallery of personified images of Russia served as an excellent illustration of the cycles of hopes connected with another stage of Russia's modernization and disappointments with its outcomes that the American society has experienced and continues to experience today. Due to their national traditions, ideological zeals, uh, messianic moods, uh, religious enthusiasm, Americans isolated between feeling inspired by Russia's impending westernization and pessimism concerning Russia's unchangeable authoritarian essence. This change in sentiments and moods was reflected in political cartoons inevitably. Movement away from uh, a demonic depiction of Soviet leaders toward romantic ones started at the time of Mikhail Gorbachev and peaked at the time of Boris Yeltsin, who initially emerged as the Russian Lincoln to become transformed during the second part of his presidency into a vodka soused builder of democracy, Alarus. But the peak of this uh, new uh, romantic crusade uh, coincided with the first presidency of Boris Yeltsin. But this process started it work during Gorbachev era. Uh, already in February 1987, uh, Nicholas Garden's uh, cartoons published in the Independent magazine depicted Gorbachev with a torch of liberty raised high while Reagan was pictured with his torch of liberty blown out following the scandal around the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, I would like to emphasize that during the Cold War, American cartoonists transformed the Statue of Liberty into the Statue of Unliberty uh, as they depicted Soviet rulers who at the same time were the so-called duck twins of the American presidents. Only one example, uh, Iosif Stalin in the image of the Statue of Unliberty. Jeremy Castella, the Knickerbocker News, 1952. Excuse me. But now we see uh, how Gorbachev and um, Reagan swapped places, which could be seen as a landmark development. In 1988, American cartoonists already did depict Gorbachev as a son 
whose race melted the Cold War snowman. Pay attention to the screen. This is the way Tony Oz depicted the Soviet uh, leader engaging the darkness versus light communicative strategy. Uh, but this time, however, the USSR was on the side of light and not on the side of darkness as it had been during the Cold War. However, not all cartoonists uh, were as optimistic as Ort, even when Reagan visited Moscow. You see another example, Dick Locher, uh, very famous, uh, who is very famous uh, American cartoonist, depicted Reagan and Gorbachev at the Moscow summit, still looking at each other through the prism of their visual stereotypes. Uh, Reagan imagined Gorbachev as Darth Vader, and Gorbachev imagined Reagan as a Rambo. So we see the same uh, images as it was during the Cold War. But we need time to see how Gorbachev will be on the light side of the force. Now he is on the dark side of the force as a dark Vader. Uh, at the same time, and however, Reagan's visit to Moscow in May, early June 1988, and his words that he no longer saw the Soviet Union as the evil empire, his uh, conversations with Soviet people on the Red Square and the trust that formed between him and Gorbachev became a logical conclusion to the ongoing process of abandoning old images and metaphors. In a word, the Cold War dragon was defeated by the leaders of the USSR and their uh, changes happened in uh, representations of Gorbachev. Gorbachev Vader had gone over to the light side of the force. And this is the finish of this process that started, began earlier. Uh, an unprecedented event in Soviet-American relations happened, took place in 1987-1988. The first ever exchange of satirists and humorists of two countries. Uh, it happened uh, due to the energy, due to the efforts of James Boren. James Boren was president of the American International Association of Professional Bureaucrats. Of course, this is satirical title of the title of this organization. This famous American political satirist and humorist served um, in the US Navy dur during uh, World War II. Uh, then he took part twice, as I remember, in um, uh, 1972 and in 1984 in the presidential elections among candidates from Democratic Party. He worked for, uh, he worked with Kennedy administration and for State Department. So uh, he, he published many books, many books, humorous books. The famous one is When in Doubt Mumble, the handbook of bureaucrats. So following his visit to the Soviet Union in 1985, Boron succeeded in setting up regular Soviet-American exchanges between humorists and satirists of two countries. He was sure that, I quote, one humorist could do more to foster mutual understanding between the two peoples than 10 politicians. The first Soviet humorist team toured the United States in 1987, while next year American satirists and humorists toured the Soviet Union under the slogans, explosive laughter is better than explosive. In 1989-1990, another round of exchanges followed. As a result of these exchanges, uh, the first book of Soviet cartoons, 
uh, has been published, was published in the United States. And you see the cover of this uh, book. Via his cousin David, uh, who was a US Senator, James Boren presented this book, a copy of course of this book, to President George Bush. And President George Bush in response sent him letter. And you see abstract from this letter. Uh, this letter was published in the Crocodile. I applaud your good goal to infuse laughter, humor, and goodwill into the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Surely, we, if we can laugh together, we can also solve tough problems together. In 1990, the Crocodile published a separate issue titled The Laughing United States of America, dedicated to the culture of American humor. Joel Goodman, a participant of the second uh, Soviet-American exchanges emphasized that humor, unlike gravity, makes, uh, makes uh, hardships of life easier and brings our countries closer together. I look into the future hoping that humor will allow us to build bridges between our countries. So at the end of the Cold War, Russians and Americans could laugh together clear in a way the hills in the path of cooperation and mocking the stereotypes of mutual perceptions from the times of the Cold War. The changes in representations of enemy number one in American and Soviet films. Uh, as the uh, visual paradigm uh, was changing in cartoons and the magological detente was transpiring in American and Soviet films as well. Changes uh, begin to occur since the mid uh, 1980s. Of course, Rocky IV was full of American triumphalism and anti-Soviet stereotypes, but another Stallone sequel Rambo III was outdated even before it hit the screen. And it became a box office flop. At the same time, other films of the late 1980s evidence clear changes in the representations of the Soviet. Even an unsophisticated comedy is Spice Like Us, pay attention to the screen, of 1985, uh, even in this film, we see changes. Maybe uh, from the first glance, everything seems to be painfully familiar. Uh, but it turns out that it is bad Americans who want to launch a Russian missile against the United States to start a nuclear war, wait it out in the bunkers, and then emerge as master of both. And three fearless American spies and three fearless uh, Soviet missile men of both genders, by the way, saved the world between kisses. So, and uh, it's really changes that happened uh, in the films. In turn, the sequel, Iron Eagle features Soviet and American pilots joining their forces to destroy a nuclear facility. And even though the Pentagon is still as hostile as uh, ever, and even though the American military are not ready to share their secrets with the Russian, but we see the new team of Soviet and American pilots uh, joining their forces to destroy their uh, nuclear facility in country um, that uh, in reality remind us Iran. This cinematic narrative, just like many others uh, in later period of time, is dominated by the motive of, of unequal partnership between Americans and Russians. This is not surprising, given that the 1990s saw another wave of American hopes of Russia's westernization. 
and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia's, Russia once again became the subject of American crusade for freedom, American messianic impulses and their religious and economic fears. However, changes in cinematic representations were very visible. First, although films reminded audiences of the evil nature of the Soviet Union, yet it also exposed their uh, American own military and espionage operations. Very bright, uh, brightly changes. Second, Russians were now played by famous Hollywood actors who humanized these images. The performances ranged from Kevin Costner uh, in No Way Out uh, of 1987 and to Arnold Schwarzenegger in Red Heat in 1988. These films revised ideological cliches of the past and emphasized their faults of both the Soviet and American society. These trends were further developed in the 1990s. However, their transition from hostility to ambivalence and then to friendliness was not uninterrupted and comprehensive. However, however in visual tone certainly taking place in the American movie making. Undoubtedly, the entire plot of John McTiernan's uh, The uh, Hunt for Red October uh, 1990 was contrasted around the threat of a nuclear war and getting the enemy's cutting edge weapons. However, this film also abandoning this tradition, the tradition of depicting Russians solely, solely as caricatures. And uh, CIA officer finds common grounds with the Soviet submarine captain played by Sean Connery, famous for his role as James Bond. Undoubtedly, Red Heat abounded in stereotypes and inaccuracies that are sometimes funny and sometimes not. However, in that film, a, Russians, a, a Russian, not an American, saved half the world from the heroin plague. Plague, excuse me. You see the citation from uh, uh, the crocodile as a reaction to the film uh, Red Heat. I would like to emphasize the last uh, sentence in this citation. But we are not longer the evil empire whose every initiative, every proposal should be treated as part of some evil scheme. Soviet films of the Cold War era, just like Soviet cartoons, were intended to emphasize the fault of the hostile American other and the advantages of the Soviet self, while bad Americans in Soviet films corresponded to bad Russians in American Cold War productions. Those bad Americans were spies and murders. In this sense, Soviet and American films mirrored each other with one major differences. Difference, excuse me. Soviet movies did not exhibit the critical self-reflection that was present in American movie making since the 1960s. I would like to remind you the film of Stanley Kubrick, uh, Dr. Strange Love or How I Long to Stop a War and Love the Bomb or Sidney Lumet's uh, Fail Safe uh, or Stanley Kramet, Kramers uh, on the beach. Uh, and uh, this is the usual situation. We see how American screen became the uh, uh, environment, not only for black and white picture, picture but also as a uh, space for criticism toward American domestic and foreign policy. Uh, but both Soviet and American Cold War audiences dealt with easily uh, visual codes that allowed them to tell their people from strangers, uh, heroes from villains, and good from evil. In the early 1980s, anti-American propaganda was still present in Soviet films uh, funded by the government. And mass audiences 
continued to see dishonest, dishonest Americans in their decaying West, so-called decaying West. These images, however, were not very persuasive against the background of the late Soviet stagnation period. Changes uh, began to take place during the perestroika, when the Soviet society was going through a phase of being inspired by America as it welcomed Americans wise, America's wise advice and promises of financial assistance. Romanticization of the image of America became a radically new cinematic trend reflected both in musical comedies and dramas. The first genre was represented by a mini series, Jack Vasmurkin, pay attention to the screen, an American. Uh, and um, what is very important in this film, this is desire of uh, these uh, uh, men who visited the United States and spent in the United States uh, some years. Uh, so his desire to teach his village comrades uh, the lessons of American capitalism. And uh, because thanks to this idea, because of this idea, uh, this film uh, was released only in 1988. Because of this comparison of the successive way, uh, farmer way of the United States and uh, Soviet collectivism. The second genre was represented by Pavel Lungin's uh, Taxi Blues. Uh, of, 19, of uh, 1990. This optimistic film made in the traditions of an action film body movie. And this film tells the story of friendship uh, between uh, of uh, very talented uh, saxophone player, Soviet player and uh, African-American performer. Thanks to this friendship, uh, Soviet player received opportunity to go to the United States and to pursue his happiness. And uh, the main opposition in this film, this is the contrast between the United States as a country of equal opportunities and the hopeless uh, Russian reality. And finally, I would like to mention uh, Soviet Polish, in reality, this is Soviet Polish film, uh, Deja Vu, directed by Julius Machulski, that reflects another very important trend in the changing cinematic reality the willingness to love both at the American other and at the Soviet self. This is how new American contests are being debilized in the Soviet movie making. In the 1990s, given the economic crisis and post-Soviet Russia and lack of financing, uh, Russian movie making was mostly focused on uh, searching for a new identity and on uh, reconceptualization of the historical past instead uh, of revising the image of Cold War enemies. Additionally, since the middle of the decade, uh, Russian cinematic text began to exhibit mountaining disappointment with the United States itself, whereas our characters inevitably traveled after the collapse of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and in reality, this is a very um, bright trend uh, in uh, 1990s. Uh, I would like to remind you Karen Shekhnazarov's uh, American daughter or uh, Alexei Balabanov's uh, brat too. Uh, and so we can see this trend of disappointments uh, in uh, Russian uh, movie making. And the last part of my presentation, uh, which is devoted to the animation, animation against stereotypes. In 1989, uh, Yefim Gamburg, he is very famous uh, animated film director, prepared the first Soviet American animated film, Stereotypes. 
written by Rita Grachova, Paul Simon, Jerry Robinson. Partially psychedelic, this uh, animation became one of the brightest illustration of the visual tone at the end of the Cold War. Pay attention to this picture. This is the first picture of this um, uh, animation. It opened with the legendary mass film logo with the Statue of Liberty uh, inserted between Vera Muhina's worker and peasant uh, woman. And after that, you see um, depositories of Soviet American artifacts. And faceless person who working through this, uh, this uh, depository. He approached a mirror. Uh, he sat down before the mirror and uh, he began to put on makeup. One by one, he opened boxes labeled aggression, stupidity, ignorance, um, hatred, fear, and the little power the clouds produced pictures of uh, wild looking Uncle Sam's, of wild looking bears with fur coats uh, and uh, Russian Cossacks. And after that show of stereotypes began, hosted by uh, Uncle Sam and American Eagle on the American side and by a Russian bear uh, uh, in company with Kozak on the other side. Both sides demonstrated stereotypes and then used them as some kind of bricks uh, built up the high wall of Cold War. Both looked very funny, very mm, hilarious. Uh, especially when they um, danced together swing or uh, Russian Kalinka Malinka dance. Uh, both uh, really, uh, both sides are really very funny. And uh, from my point of view, that was a uh, very uh, bright uh, symptom, symbol, because shared laughter is incompatible with fear. Because when images of an enemy prompt a kind smile, such an enemy is no longer scary. But this merry show was periodically interrupted by so-called advertisement from sponsored. It could be Rubik's cube with the pictures of enemy. So you can uh, combine them and start hating or it could be um, advertisement of incendiary devices. The result of their use is the nuclear winter. The animated short included video footage of the arms race and nuclear explosions that delighted only American and Soviet generals. The result was clear. Peels of skulls, piles of skulls, mountains of skulls. And it was uh, really, truly horrifying. Rita Grachova stressed that a story that is initially funny is slowly turning into a nightmare. And uh, uh, transitions from animation to live action intercut with documentaries make the audiences ponder the dangerous, dangerous link between an artificially created world of stereotypes and real um, uh, life. The arms race in reality uh, was the final round of the animated competition and the last brick in the Cold War world. After the wall melts in the rays of the sun and butterflies of the colors of Soviet and American flags flutter across the screen. As the distorting mirror of the Cold War splits into fragments, uh, the psychedelic person from the first shots regains his true American face. And the song, who are you, we are, what we are, 
written and brilliantly performed by Alexander Gradsky and Cindy Peters begins to play. Pay attention to the screen, words from this song. Both the animated film and the song aim to convey to the audiences the idea of Russians and the Americans being different, but their differences will not get in the way of their mutual understanding in both sides consign their mutual myths and stereotypes to the scrap pile of history. This call is very relevant today as it was at the end of the Cold War. And when we are thinking about the new Cold War of images in Russian-American relation, when we are thinking about the desire, desire of both sides to use communicative strategies from the Cold War discourses, we need to take into account that the main problem in uh, Russian-American relations now is the desire to save value-based approach to the agenda of Russian-American relations instead of pragmatic. Uh, in reality, this story that I presented to you today is it important for us today because this story about the uh, development, uh, the environment space for dialogue on different levels, dialogue, academic, expert, uh, between politicians, between people of two countries for better understanding of each other, for better understanding uh, of the dangers of stereotypes and myths. And this understanding and this knowledge is one of the main lessons of, the, of this last uh, period of the Cold War, uh, lessons of the end of the Cold War. I see that I missed all my time. The time is over, Eric, I see. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. Hey, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk, and it's, I, I've now added uh, Jack Jack Vasmyorkin to my to my uh, list of movies to watch someday. Um, I've seen Taxi <laughs> Blues, but not not this one. Um, so I, I recommend you to uh, find in YouTube. You can find this uh, animation, this animated film, uh, stereotypes, uh, because in reality, uh, this is very. Um, bright illustration of this visual tone. It's unimaginable uh, for nowadays a Russian-American relation, such a together animation, such a together uh, common laughter as it happened in 1989, and it was a period of Cold War. Yeah, this will be great. I'll, I'll, I'll show it to my students. I think this will be, will be perfect for, for, for classroom teaching. I, I wanted to ask, and and I encourage everyone watching. Uh, I know we have a good crowd of people watching. So if you want to write any questions you have in the in the chat or uh, use the Q and A function, but while there's no questions right now, I'll, I'll ask. Um, I'm wondering, um, Victoria, if you can say a bit more about this idea of a new Cold War of images and and when when do you see it beginning? Right, because there's different ways of of sort of different chronologies of thinking about US-Russian relations. And you've mentioned already in the 1990s, some ambiguities and uh, some disillusionment uh, with, with ideas of the United States in Russia uh, for, for I think very, very obvious and understandable reasons. But when do you see this, how would you periodize this new Cold War of images and, and you know, what do you think is driving it? And also maybe while you're answering that, I'm wondering, you know, I was struck in your presentation by how there are different forms of media uh, now uh, that were not around the 1980s. And so particularly I'm thinking about memes and other types of internet portrayals, uh, but I'll, I see you've got a really striking images up there. So I'll let you, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this question, Eric. Uh, uh, it should be the last part of my talk today uh, as some kind of conclusion. Um, in reality, the Cold War discourse appeared in the United States after Munchen's speech of uh, um, Vladimir Putin. But if we are talking about the real uh, new Cold War of images, uh, the uh, uh, 
beginning of this process uh, is 2014. This is annexation of Crimea in reality. Of course, we see uh, anti-Putin cartoons uh, from the beginning of uh, this century, but not uh, very early. Uh, when we are talking about the real Cold War of images, uh, we need to uh, find correlations between the crisis in Russian-American relations. And this crisis began in uh, 2014, although we see signs of this crisis before uh, this period. Uh, I would like to show you some cartoons and uh, to answer on your question further. Uh, you see uh, uh, cartoons of Vitaly Podvitsky. He's in cooperation with the um, uh, he's in cooperation with the Russian Russian Information Agency, and uh, he is very famous in Russian segment of internet thanks to his anti-American and pro-Putin cartoons. He uh, created uh, uh, a new, um, uh, this is some kind of studio, this is some kind of organization of patriotic minded young people who would like to create cartoons, posters uh, or memes and who would like uh, to understand the process. Uh, uh, the uh, title of this, um, Mm, uh, organization Studio 13, and Padvitsky helped this organization. And in his cartoon, I mean Vitaly Padvitsky, uh, we can retrace the same communicative strategies as during the Cold War. Uh, I um, uh, would like to uh, illustrate this idea by two cartoons. First, pay attention to the right. This is a very uh, old uh, uh, communicative strategy. Uh, this communicative strategy correlates with uh, so-called whataboutism. Uh, and uh, when uh, Soviet diplomats asked about human rights, violation of human rights in the Soviet Union, they answered, what about racial discrimination in the United States? What about uh, domestic problems in the United States? So we see the same idea in visual discourse, in memes, political cartoons. They are trying to torture us, but their desire is ludicrous. They have a lot of problem in domestic and foreign policy. So uh, we can uh, retrace this idea uh, here in this cartoon, pay attention to Ferguson wrote, Ferguson, Charlottesville, shooting. So find the uh, uh, source sports in American reality and emphasize these sports. And in this um, cartoon, we see another communicative strategy, but uh, we see switching roles. Uh, so as yes, to claim the site of good uh, for Putin, uh, because uh, you see Barack Obama in the image of Jabba the Hutt, sometimes as a Darth Vader, and Putin as a uh, Luke Skywalker. And uh, Putin Skywalker uh, proclaiming that there is a Jedi for every dark side of the force. And another very important symbol, Nazi swastika. Uh, uh, he tried to label uh, Barack Obama and America as enemy number one uh, because Nazi swastika is very understandable symbol for uh, Russian people. So we see the same communicative strategy now. Uh, and uh, for example, another illustration from American side, this is the cycle of hopes and disappointments in American political cartoons. You see the same ideas, Cold War and uh, Putin as a statue of unliberty. Do you remember Joseph Stalin in image of a statue of unliberty? Now Putin is in, in, in statue of unliberty. So we see how uh, the old communicative strategies, uh, devices, uh, Cold War discusses, 
uh, are using now for domestic purposes because uh, the consequences of this value-based uh, approach from both sides, from the United States and from Russia, is the desire to use the image of another country for the domestic political games. Uh, if we're talking about uh, Putin's Russia, this is a very important trend uh, because anti-Americanism is very uh, uh, comfortable for the construction of national ID in Putin's Russia. Uh, and uh, if you would like to find example in the United States, uh, I can remind you the 2016 presidential elections when both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton used an image of Putin as the other for their domestic purposes. And as a result, we uh, received uh, anti-Russian anti Trump consensus as anti-Russian consensus. This, this desire to use other uh, as a, as a, uh, in a national um, uh, domestic political games, in a national identity discourse is very important trend. What we can see is a difference if we're talking about uh, uh, cartoons or uh, film uh, movie makers uh, now in post-Soviet Russia. We see alternative discourse. Of course, we can uh, pay attention to the cartoons of Vitaly Podvisky that I demonstrated you, but you can find cartoons of Sergei Yolkin, open-minded Sergei Yolkin, who is in cooperation with the uh, Radio Sv Svoboda station, and who is mocking in his cartoons the desire of pro-Kremlin uh, state-controlled media to use uh, the United States as the other for domestic purposes. We saw alternative films. Uh, of course, we can uh, talk about sleepers as well as we can talk about the Red Sparrow in the United States, but we can find uh, in post-Soviet Russia alternative discourse. I mentioned about the absence of this trend during the Cold War, when I um, told about um, uh, self-reflections and remind you Stanley Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strange Love or Stanley Kramer's on the beach uh, and so on. But now we can see these self-reflections both in cartoons, in movies, in memes, we see how alternative discourse uh, uh, is created in social media uh, and how young people, some of them, of course, can join Vitaly Padvitsky studio, but some of them are ready to be much more responsible for uh, their process inside uh, their countries. Uh, and we have a, a semi-official and independent media uh, that uh, help those who would like to know the market of opinion in uh, uh, every case to find this opportunity. So we see this trade, we see these trends, uh, uh, both in the United States and in Russia. We can talk about the Cold War of Images from uh, the beginning of the current crisis in Russian-American relation after the annexation of Crimea, after that. Although the first uh, um, idea of Cold War, the new Cold War, uh, appeared after uh, München's speech of uh, Vladimir Putin in 2007, by the way, in the United States. Now, uh, the uh, um, contradictions, the um, tom, uh, the conflict uh, uh, this is the new norm in Russian-American relations. And uh, we see how uh, state-controlled media in Russia, uh, media in Russia, media in Russia is doing uh, their best to use this image. So now we are inside this uh, reality, but at the same time, we see alternative discourse in post-Soviet Russia. We see opportunity to uh, broad knowledge about the United States. By the way, I've just finished a huge project in cooperation with the American Cultural Center. Uh, 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 
professional Americans, Americanists, professional specialist on American studies from um, a Russian State University, from my university, from St. Petersburg University, from Samara University, uh, prepared 80, 80 lectures, 80 videos, 40 podcasts about the different aspects of the American history, politics, culture, mass culture, mass consumer culture, cultural diplomacy, American literature. Uh, inside this project, we are talking about different aspects of the American model of developments. So, and uh, when I created this team and when we started this program, began this project, uh, I uh, took in mind the idea that we don't need to demonstrate pink picture of America or black picture of America, multifaceted America. Uh, for us, it was very important to emphasize how this society found in the past and is trying in the present the uh, uh, opportunities to overcome new crisis, to go to the uh, democracy in different aspects and uh, what kind of lessons we can understand from this experience. Uh, so this is one opportunity for us to broad uh, this uh, environment for dialogue. This is pedagogy for everybody, for everybody in popular style. You can see black uh, pages of American history, black pages, uh, but in uh, historical context and as a process that can be changeable. Uh, another um, good trend from my point of view is the development of American Studies program. Now we can uh, tell about the new interests in student environment to uh, uh, American studies program, not to hate America, to love America, but to understand America. And for example, now within my program on American studies, uh, now around 100 students, I mean only bachelor degree program, only bachelor degree program on different uh, levels. And uh, they would like to hear American speakers to write uh, different American outlets. Uh, they have internet, they can read New, New York Times, they can uh, hear CNN, Fox News, different outlets in order, outlets in order to uh, find different uh, approach, man, different uh, approaches, excuse me, different comments, and uh, to receive opportunity for better understanding of what is going on in the United States. Uh, and this is another new trend because uh, we uh, can't tell about uh, such process during the Cold War, for example. Mm -hmm. In 1990s, and I, we knew, uh, we knew, we, excuse me, we saw a new crusade for Russian freedom. But the second part of Yeltsin presidency, the second presidency of Yeltsin, we see the uh, end of this cycle of hopes. We see disappointment stage. And after that, during Putin's presidency, we see this very, very long stage of disappointment interrupted by a uh, reset period, by Medvedev presidency, and uh, uh, their, ten uh, their uh, understanding with uh, Barack Obama during the reset period. And now, uh, from 2014 is the new wave of the Cold War ages. So, Great. thank you. Um, I I do want to. There's a three questions that have come in, and and the first actually you were speaking about American studies uh, in Russia, which you know it's, it's really it's really encouraging to hear. There's so much interest. Uh, in fact, I I sort of wonder here because we've seen a lot of interest in Russia. In some ways, the the difficulties in U.S.-Russian relations have actually increased interest in, in Russian studies here. Uh, but the question is from my colleague, Elizabeth Esch, who's in our uh, Department of American Studies here at KU. Uh, and she's asking about this 1984 movie, uh, Moscow on the Hudson. 
I, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it stars Robin Williams. And, you know, he's this character who, who defects, uh, flees from his KGB minders. Uh, he's a saxophone player from the circus. Uh, and she asks, uh, I wonder why this is a, a trope uh, for these freedom seeking characters, whether it's linked to the black freedom struggle in the US perhaps. And also that Williams is an interesting choice because he's, um, so his comedy is infused with melancholy and there's a certain uh, ironic distance in his portrayal of this character and even um, even his defection in Bloomingdale's uh, might be read as a, a critique and also a superficial celebration of the U.S. So I'm just I, maybe if you could just say a little bit about what your impressions of that of that film. Um, yes, this is a very good remark. This is a very good comment. Uh, in reality, even in this film, we can see the a new um, trend, the new trend because Robert um, uh, Williams, uh, who is the main hero in this film, actor uh, in this film, uh, is very um, interesting because he's famous actor for his uh, uh, audience uh, for American audience and this is the tendency for me uh, and for us in uh, maybe not for me but for my uh, brother who is uh, um, now is um, around 60 years old uh, uh, for him it was a very important film because he saw a new character uh, of course, this is a comedy. This is a comedy. We can see many uh, comics, many uh, uh, satire in this film, but at the same time, we see new uh, trends. And uh, after that, Kevin Costner and Schwarzenegger, I uh, mentioned this film, uh, realized this, uh, uh, and even Sean Connery realized this uh, trend famous American actors began to play roles of Russians in uh, American movie. That was uh, very important for me when I was talking about these new trends. But this is comedy, okay? This is comedy. And uh, I uh, saw it with great pleasure, by the way, uh, and my student as well, although they can find many uh, aspects that it could be mocking in this film, as well as in another American films. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that um, uh, we need to understand this film in that context. As I remember the date of this film, 1984, am I right? Yeah, 1984. So. This is uh, before the perestroika. This is before the changing in the Soviet uh, Union that started later. But um, I remember that for me, it was very interesting. Uh, I saw uh, this film uh, when I was student, um, but uh, later, later uh, during my postgraduate study. And for me, it was some kind of uh, new, vision, possible vision uh, that I can see in this film, inside this film. So uh, we uh, can find different angles for our estimation, for our understanding of this movie. And I'm sure that you in the United States can uh, emphasize one aspect and we in Russia uh, emphasize another aspect. I have very interesting experience, not now because of a pandemic situation, but uh, every year, I mean academic year, I have inside my groups uh, for American studies for political system of the United States, uh, when I am teaching history of the United States or foreign policy of the United States, uh, students from the United States. So they are inside of our groups, and we are talking together about different aspects of American developments. And we see differences between their uh, approaches to their same primary sources, including visual text, because 
uh, the American students are looking at these tents from inside uh, American culture. And usually every time when we are talking about political system of the United States, my students are trying to tell, oh, uh, they have it, we don't have it. I try to stop them not to use American other for the understanding of Russia, but they are doing this in any case. And I saw how different angles and uh, different point of views uh, sometimes contradiction, contradicted inside these students' audience. In reality, these students uh, visited our university and visit our university in order to study Russia, to study uh, Russian language, Russian history, and Russian literature. And very often they visited my classes in order to better understand the United States. And they uh, present different angle and different vision of the same text. That is why for me in um, uh, Moscow on, on the hood zone that you mentioned is the new trend in American movies uh, with Russian heroes. It uh, can be, um, uh, depend on actors, it can be depend on desire to brood the characters inside this uh, movie. It can be found um, in uh, uh, words of the main heroes of this uh, uh, cinema text uh, and so on and so far. So I think that Great, thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting film, and I think you know. Also, there's a, it's a, it's sort of a critique of, or a, there's a lot of reflection in the film on on the U.S. as a nation, so-called nation of immigrants, and so that's a, I think another motif of the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, no, and no, so no. he's sort of placed in in this in this, placing because a, a, a Soviet a immigrant as tradition. Because this is a new wave of uh, immigration yeah. that started before that. Yet of yes, of course. And we can find another uh, movies later about this uh, topic. Uh, I suppose maybe maybe I need to ask uh, uh, the old generation about their perception, because I don't remember my impressions. Uh, I could uh, uh, estimate this film from today uh, inside uh, those trends that I am looking for. Uh, but for that time, and maybe for American society, immigration problem and this environment uh, is very important. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, the next question is from also from my colleague uh, here at KU, Professor Eve Levin in the History Department, um, mm -hmm. who asks about uh, how you understand the meaning of the Soviet hammer and sickle, uh, which you can see Putin's whole, Putin, the Statue of Liberty Putin is holding. Um, how do you understand the symbol as a symbol of Russia and anti-American and an American anti-Russian images in the new Cold War? Uh, does it mean that Americans are supposed to think that Russia is still communist? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that, from my point of view, I think that this is the uh, Cold War trend, the trend of Cold War of images, because I can uh, represent it many cartoons uh, when um, Putin depicted as uh, uh, Soviet leaders, as general secretaries, uh, in image of Vladimir Stalin. Uh, so, of course, this is the symbol of his authoritarian uh, power and of his desire to create something like the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, that is why, by the way, uh, we can find many examples of the same idea. Uh, and American cartoons, uh, many examples of these visual images. Uh, I can present you a bunch of such images uh, about Vladimir Putin as a new Soviet uh, uh, secretary, secretary of Communist Party. Uh, this is one of possible trends. So at the, this is uh, Cold War, uh, Cold War images, uh, without any doubt. Uh, another very important idea during the 
uh, crisis in Russian-American relations from 2014, this process uh, began in 2014, we can retrace in American cartoon from, in American cartoons from my point of view in other trends to depict uh, Putin as a descendant uh, of uh, Tsarist empire, as a new Tsar. Do you remember these uh, pictures on the cover of uh, Time? Putin as the czar, not as the first secretaries, not as the, some kind of Soviet leaders, but some kind of czar, czarist empire, conservatism, uh, old conservatism, Russian conservative, uh, that is opposition to American universal liberalism. This is another trend, uh, and uh, we can retrace this trend in American political cartoons. So yes, this is a symbol of the perception of Putin's Russia as the um, uh, descendant of uh, Soviet Union, as the descendant of authoritarian tradition of both Soviet Union and the Tsarist Empire. But in any case, this is an old, very old uh, communicative strategy statue of unliberty and at the same time uh, president as a, so a post-soviet president is a duck twin of american president because for example during the first crisis in russian american relations i mean 1903 1905 by the way the beginning of the 20th century we saw we can retrace the same strategy we can uh, uh, retrace the same approaches, visual approaches inside uh, American political cartoons. Because we saw the first cycle of hopes and disappointments. We saw romantic images and then demonic images. We saw hopes and then disappointments. Yes, of course, Russian reality, in any case, be it the Tsarist Empire, the Soviet Union, or post Soviet Russia, feed it and feeds these hopes and these disappointments without any doubts. But cycles as itself depends on American context, on American perception of the future of Russia, of American cultural and uh, political tradition. And that is why it's very important for me. So this is my angle on this. Uh, uh, trends inside American political cartooning. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think the another continuity is really the the, the personalization of of Russia as as a single person, right? And this is this is really unique. I think Americans more probably more Americans know who who the president of Russia is than know who say the leader of Canada or Mexico or other neighboring states. So it's really uh, it's really striking. There's there's one more question that has come in uh, from. Irina Osepashvili, uh, who is asking about um, whether you've encountered images or discourses around uh, the COVID-19 vaccine or the vaccine-related competition. There was there was some effort or there was some portrayal of a, of a race to the vaccine or vaccine competition between Russia and, and the US. So, so have you seen any images uh, connected to the vaccine? or the virus, the pandemic? Uh, it depends on, uh, um, it depends on um, the uh, status of uh, Russian outlets. If we are talking about state controlled media, uh, we can see a desire to emphasize advantages of Russian uh, med medicine, uh, advantages and success of Putin's politics, uh, if we are talking about uh, independent, uh, semi-independent uh, outlets, for example, if we are hearing uh, echo, echo, echo of Moscow, echo Moscow, or uh, if uh, we will find uh, uh, publications in uh, Medusa or uh, Nova Gazeta, we can find another approach and another um, view on this problem. We see how the uh, accents are changing inside these discourses because 
uh, on state-controlled media, we received information about achievements, about success, uh, that we are uh, first, that this is uh, our uh, real lesson for the rest of the world, for the rest of the world. But in independent media, uh, we uh, can uh, read about the undesire of population to use Sputnik V, to use uh, uh, this uh, Russian vaccine because they don't believe power, because they don't believe Kremlin. So in reality, we are dealing with the same, <laughs> with the same idea and with the same trends. When both sides, I mean, uh, in our case and uh, for uh, this question, Russian side is using uh, another uh, country as uh, the other, as an essential other. Uh, so uh, these Americans are trying to, to teach us lessons of democracy, the lessons of capitalism, the lessons of human rights, but we are teaching them the lessons of vaccination. This is the official position. Uh, uh, I, I don't have time to collect cartoons I would like to look through cartoons of Vitaly Padvitsky because my last uh, huge collection of cartoons, uh, I mean, both American side and Russian side, uh, was, was connected with the uh, 2016 presidential elections because uh, the internet uh, uh, was crowded <laughs> by, by the cartoons about bromance between Trump and uh, Putin, uh, about uh, this consensus, uh, anti-Russian consensus in the United States. Uh, but I suppose that we can try to look through stocks of cartoons, internet stocks of cartoons, uh, I uh, like very much if we're talking about the United States Girl Comics site, where you can find uh, cartoons of all leading American cartoonists, or you can uh, visit uh, sites of Sergei Yolkin and stock of Sergei Yolkin or Vitaly Padvitsky or Studio 13. Or uh, my students, for example, like to uh, analyze memes in. Uh, uh, internet, and this is a new trend. Uh, many students would like to uh, use visual texts, visual sources, uh, and they are trying to understand uh, methodology for that. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why um, I'm trying to organize for them some kind of master classes uh, to uh, teach how they can use uh, uh, different visual texts. Uh, American, I mean, and uh, Russian. So uh, for uh, Russia, I mean, for Putin's Russia, anti-Americanism is some kind of secular religion uh, that is very comfortable for using uh, inside uh, domestic policy for the construction of national idea. And uh, you don't find something new in state-controlled media. So the same approach to the interpretation of this uh, vaccination and so on and so far. And of course, another trend I mentioned about it, the uh, desire to pay attention to the problem inside the United States. Oh, we have a mm, very good va 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 vaccine. We, we started vaccination and look at them. What is going on in the United States? What is going on in capital of the United States? Look at the capital of the United States. Look at these crowds in, uh, around the capital. So what this design is very obvious now in this discourse. Great, thank you so much. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, uh, I know uh, uh, I, I join all of my colleagues and students and everyone else was able to join us uh, here today and thanking you uh, for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. And I think you know there should be some opportunities for, for, for working together with, with your students and ours. I know um, I got some positive comments in the chat from our, our colleagues in American studies here at KU. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll look forward to staying in touch. <laughs> But thank you, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I'm open for cooperation.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.